Hi, everyone. Um, for office hours tonight, I have two questions. First, I need to have Echo stop playing um, Mellow 70s Gold. <laughs> Echo, stop. I have this favorite playlist I love on Amazon Music called Mellow 70s Gold. And I just, when I listen to it, I just feel like I'm at home when I'm a kid and my dad is listening to the music. So I just love it. Um, the first question I want to answer comes from a parent. And the question is one that I think comes up fairly frequently. And she says, um, my daughter is seven years old and currently attending a public school nearby in a great school district. As your article stated, she's been getting all A's from her assessments while not, and she says, while not being bored at school. In my opinion, she is not gifted, but bright, WISC 127. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit later. It's really a separate question from what her main question is. So she says, however, recently I've noticed that the school pays more attention to those who are not catching things up academically than those who are average or just above the average as it is a public school. In addition, I've noticed that she has been helping other kids to learn rather than learning new things and proceeding to the next levels for her. Have I not written about this, right? I have been pounding this drum of do not use gifted kids as tutors. Um, she says, with these reasons, I applied for a gifted school and they invited my daughter to have a shadow day for three days, actually, as part of the admission process for evaluation. My concern is that her current teacher is a teacher who's very proud of herself for being a public school teacher for a long time. How could I explain politely about the absences for those shadow days and ask for a recommendation for the school? I would like to be careful and polite as there might be chances that my daughter would not get accepted to the gifted school. Also, if my daughter doesn't get accepted, do you think I should still look for another school to provide her better educational environment that helps him boost her ability to learn? Any advice would be greatly appreciated. So there's a lot to unpack here, isn't there? Um, hmm. You know, this just reminds me, I want to give a shout out to the person who makes this pottery. So this mug is called a perfect mug, and it's actually made by a teacher who is a teacher by day, a mild-mannered teacher by day, and awesome potter by night. And I'm going to put a link in the comment, but um, I love her pottery. She actually doesn't live that far from me. So if she's at a fair or something, I can go get some, but she also has an Etsy shop and I just love supporting other teachers. And truly this is the perfect mug because your thumb, it has like this pad for your thumb and it also grips beautifully. So anyway, I'm not a coffee drinker, but this is a herbal tea and I, I love this mug. Let me, I'm gonna go ahead and share her link there. Um, She's great. I just put it in the YouTube one. I'll go back and add it to the, oh, it looks like it put it in the Facebook one too. So if you're joining on YouTube or Facebook, welcome. So how do I answer this question from this woman? And I think that what we really need to do is get several things that are going on here. We've got the dynamic of, is the child gifted or just bright, just bright? Um, what do we do when a child's needs aren't being met in school? How do we address that with the current school? And how do we handle absences for shadow days and an application process to another school while one is still being attended? How do we do all of that? And so I wanna unpack this from easiest to most difficult to answer. The first thing I wanna address is how do you explain to the current school that you are looking into other schools? In some ways it feels like you're in a serious long-term relationship, but you're swiping right on like a school dating app. <laughs> and it can feel like a betrayal, especially because um, particularly with public school, and, and I'm a public school teacher, with public school, um, we sometimes feel like public school and public school teachers get defensive about other opportunities. And I think that that can be true but typically it's only true if people are trying to denigrate the public school or to um, say in some way that public schools are somehow inferior to private schools or charter schools or some other school alternative. 
and which which would be offensive and objectionable. But let's look at what do we do in general in this situation. So I truly believe that the best course of action is honesty. The best course of action is honesty. And I think the honesty can be shared in a way that is not hurtful. So um, the first thing I would do is I would be very intentional about thinking about exactly what issues that I'm seeing. So this parent does a good job of saying, I've noticed that she's helping other kids to learn new things rather than moving to the next level herself. So I think that the more of those kind of specific things, not just in general, I want to go to this bougie school, but rather I'm noticing these things that concern me in classroom practice. And because of that, we've decided to go explore some other things. While we're doing that, I'd love to open a conversation with you about what we can do in this environment. Like, are you open to having my daughter's need to work at a, a deeper, quicker, you know, fill in the blank for whatever um, adjective you want to use, but at a different pace or a different um, uh, experience, immersion, whatever, right? Like how open are you? So I think that one thing is you don't want to burn any bridges. Um, this is true for teachers as well. Meaning if a parent approaches you and says, we're looking into these other schools, we're considering having, you know, moving our child's school experience attendance, then, um, I think we need to not burn bridges. We need to be open at heart, everybody here has the best interest of the child, right? At least let's assume that's true. So the teacher wants the child in the best possible placement for the child. And the parent wants the child in the best possible placement for the child. One of the things that I have to accept as a teacher is not anything necessarily to do with my teaching quality, but rather to do with just the constraints of a system that I may not be able to provide the best possible environment for this student. In fact, this comes up not just with a student trying to go to another school, but also a student just going to another classroom. So I have had this situation where a parent requests a conference and I go in and they say, I want, you know, I want my kid to move to this other class. And a lot of teachers who I've taught with very defensive when that happens. They're, they don't want it. A lot of schools have policies about it. And my feeling may not be popular, but my feeling is, look, teaching is a relationship. And if that relationship isn't working, then let's do all we can to help the child get into a relationship that is working. And by forcing a child to stay in a placement that's not the right fit, it usually doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the teacher. It doesn't help the parent. It doesn't help the child. One year, I remember, um, so I teach multiple grade levels. And so it's very common for me to have a student over multiple years. There have been a handful of students who, bless their hearts, have had me for 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Partly because I teach multiple grade levels and partly because I teach multiple content areas. So they may have had me for English for a couple of years and then they have me for social studies, right? So one year I had a student who had been in my 10th grade English class and in 11th grade, her friend was still in my class, but she was moved to the class of another teacher. And it's funny because this happened like over 10 years ago. And it just came up in a conversation the other day with a, with a colleague. We were talking about, do you remember when this happened? So what happened was in my 11th grade English class, I teach Huckleberry Finn and I teach the entire novel. Our district curriculum requirement was at that time, now they don't even require that novel to be taught, but, but at that time, the requirement was that you only had to teach six pages. So the teacher next to me was teaching six pages of Huckleberry Finn, and I was teaching the entire novel. So um, the parent of this girl who had 
been in my class the year before and now was in this class of the six page teacher and her best friend is in the class of the read the whole book, including like the author's notes and the commentary, right? Um, they're talking. And the parent went and requested that her daughter be moved back to my class. Like she had Mrs. Van for 10th grade. And now I want her back. This new class is too easy. Mrs. Van is really hard. And I want her in Mrs. Van's class. I don't want her reading six pages of Huck Finn. I want her reading the whole book. Well, I didn't even know that this was going on. What happened was the teacher who, the six page teacher actually went to central office and filed a complaint against me, like a formal complaint against me and got investigated that I was recruiting students. I didn't even know that it was going on. But the whole time it was happening, I thought, why are you so, why are you so, uh, um, like, I don't even know the word, right? Like, why do you have such a scarcity mentality about this? Why are you determined that you're going to keep a kid in your class who does not want to be there? Like, if they're a problem student, wouldn't you rather have them go somewhere else? And if they're not a problem student, why would you want to punish them? Like, let them go. Half the time they get into the new class and they want to go back. So that happens too, right? So they did not let this girl come into my class. And it was an issue all year. And it was an issue between that teacher and I for the rest of the time I was on that campus. And so I feel like one of the things we have to do as teachers is step back from that. It's not about us. We need to not take it so personally. And that's really hard because teaching is so personal. We pour our heart and soul into it, right? I don't, I know most teachers feel that they give their best, right? I don't know any teacher who gets up in the morning and says, you know, I'm going to go and see like, how boring can I make this day, right? That's not what we're doing. At the same time, I know that I am not always the best fit for a student. And I know that my school is not always the best fit for a student. I teach at a school that put the T in Title I. Uh, that isn't the best fit for every kid. They just, they struggle with a very diverse group. And, and you can argue that they should learn how to deal with that. And I don't disagree, but with difficulties in socioeconomic status have also unfortunately come quite a bit of violence, right? Um, we've, we have fights, we've had assistant principals in headlocks, we've had knifings on our campus, like there's, there's danger there. And for some students, they're just, they cannot deal with that. They can't learn in that kind of environment. And I understand that. So Lynn, Teacher Likes Book says it was teacher ego. We have to put student needs first. And I think there is teacher ego in there. I totally agree with you. I think we need to step back. So one of the reasons that parents are nervous about approaching us is because they're worried about offending our ego. And we have to take that ego out. So what I would say is be honest. The first thing I would say is give the teacher compliments on the things you think he or she is doing well so that they know that you are aware. And I'm not saying this as like, use the sandwich method where you say something nice before you say something mean and then you say something nice again. Everyone sees through that. Everyone hates that, at least I do. Like, I can't stand it when people do that. I'm like, get to what you really wanna say, right? Why I think you should point out the things that you think the teacher is doing well first is because it's important that they know that you're aware of what really is going on that's positive in the classroom. Otherwise, they might think that your child is just coming home telling you only the bad stuff and not telling you any of the good stuff. So if you lead with what you know that is going on that's positive in the classroom or in the school, then they know you are looking at it from a 360 view. You're not just looking at it from a narrow, only complaining perspective. Because one thing that a lot of parents don't realize is that when students tell parents about what happens in class, they leave out almost all the parts, right? They can't recite for you everything that happened in a whole school day. So they usually tell parents, and I say you, but really I'm a parent too. They tell me the stuff that stuck out, the things that were odd, unusual, the things that they think we're going to want to hear as parents. And so sometimes that's just the negative stuff. And so we have to make sure to leave it that. So I would lead with something like, I love the way this school does X, Y, Z. 
right? My child has had a great experience with XYZ. I love the way you handle XYZ. My child's happy in your class and really likes you. You're a great teacher. You know, whatever you say is actually true, right? And then you say, I have been concerned about a couple of things and, and I and I'm worried that there are things that you don't even have control over. And we have this opportunity to visit the other school. And I don't want to just pull her out of this school and put her in this other school because I do think this is a great school. But I, at the same time, I just wouldn't feel like I was fulfilling my duty as a parent if I didn't look into all of these, uh, um, into these options that my child has. So they do a three day like test visit to see if it's a good fit. And I love that idea because we do love this school and I wouldn't, I don't, I'm not at the point where I'm ready to say, yes, we're going to this other school. So we want to go visit it for these three days. And I know that that puts a burden on you because you have to prepare a bunch of makeup work. And I know that that's a lot. Now, look, if you're a parent and you don't know how much work it is to have a student out for three days, let me tell you as a teacher, it's a lot of work. You're putting a lot of work on a teacher when a child is gone for three days. Just gathering the work, grading the work out of sync, keeping up it, making sure it gets turned in, following it up, just having to do everything out of the normal pattern is an executive function and time burden. So acknowledge that. Acknowledge that you realize that. If the child goes and has the good days and you do want to move to that school, then you're ready to go back and ask for the recommendation. Then you go back and say, you know, you've done a really good job. When we went to the school, it turned out it was a great fit. And it lists the things that you liked about that school that this teacher has no control over. Okay? We like that there were smaller class sizes. You know, we love things that you can't change because you're the teacher, right? You don't, you don't, you didn't get to create your ideal school. But at this school, there's a smaller class size or a smaller, a lower teacher to student ratio. There's um, this particular extracurricular event that she really likes or they allow them to do this flexible thing or they have theater productions or whatever it is, right? Whatever it is that, that you feel like they offered that this current school can't offer. And then you say, you've done such a good job preparing her and your opinion about my child means a lot. I would love it and sincerely appreciate it if you would write a letter of recommendation for the school, the quality they're looking for X, Y, Z. When you put it this way, and this isn't just blowing smoke, this isn't some like lie, any anything. This is honest. Be honest, but be kind and be positive. There's no need to hurt people's feelings. There's no need for criticism. This is there's no need to break a relationship and burn bridges, right? So when the teacher does give you a recommendation, and this is true not just if you're moving to another school, but this is true if a teacher writes a letter of recommendation for anything. I think it is of utmost importance that a thank you note is written. I have had, I have saved every thank you note I have ever received from a parent and a student. And it takes time to write these letters of recommendation. And I very much appreciate it when someone takes the time to write me a thank you note. And if I'm teaching young children, like I had to write letters of recommendation for my elementary students for like special camps and things or things in the arts. And I I love it if they include like a picture that the child drew me or, or something like that. So make sure that you express appreciation for that because you did take that teacher's time and time is very, very precious. That's how I would handle that. If the school says, you know, we don't give excused absences for that. They're unexcused absences. Then what I would do is approach the school you want to visit and tell them these absences are unexcused. Are there any days coming up where the public school is off, but you're in session? Um, or is there any other way that we can get around this? I don't want her to have unexcused absences because they won't let her make the work. Whatever the what are the consequences for unexcused absences? Look, if the consequence of unexcused absence is nothing more than that it says unexcused absence on the record, 
to the unexcused absence, right? It's not jail. So now, why do schools care so much about attendance? Schools care about attendance because in most states, the school gets money for the student being in attendance that day. I was a guest on a podcast, the Royal Caribbean blog podcast. I was a guest on that podcast talking about when should you take kids out of school to go on a cruise. And one of the things that I mentioned was um, you have to be mindful of the fact that the school still has to pay the teacher. The school, school still has to run the lights. The school still has to pay the insurance. The school still has to pay the custodians. If your kid's not there that day and they don't get the money from the state, like in our state, it's a per thing. If this kid is not in their seat at this particular time of day, the school doesn't get any money, even if they come later that day. So it's a weird system, but the, the school didn't make the system up and they got to operate within that. So that's why one of the reasons why schools care so much about attendance. Another reason is um, it's hard to recreate school. It's It really is hard to recreate school. And that can be an entire other live stream. So that's how I would handle that. Let me approach the second issue of is her daughter gifted or just bright? And for those of you who've joined me after I read the letter, let me say the this is a mom who's considering moving her child to another school. And she says, um, in my opinion, she is not gifted but bright. Whisk 127. So what does she mean by that? A whisk is the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. This is David Wexler and his test of many colors. David Wexler um, was the psychologist who came up with the WIPSI, which is the preschool one. This is for pre-readers. Um, so you usually only see this for kids like up until the age of maybe four or five. And then you have the WISC, which is the most commonly used one, the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. This is a, um, a full scale IQ assessment. Now, not every evaluator will use all of the subtests. Sometimes they will just give four of them um, for different tests, but a full scale Wexler is a pretty good look at that kid. Um, now, the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children has multiple versions and multiple subtests, and it will look at all kinds of different things, language, spatial reasoning, coding, there's, there's a lot on there. Um, it also looks at processing speed. And there has been some criticism of this particular test, particularly in an earlier version, that it put too much emphasis on processing speed that harmed gifted kids who might be deep thinkers, but not quick thinkers. That aside, the WIC is a reputable test. And it is a very good instrument. And I would be interested to see if this was a full-scale IQ or what we sometimes see, which is a GAI, that stands for General Abilities Index, and that's where they take out processing speed. Personally, while that's very popular to use with gifted kids, personally, I don't like GAI. Um, but that's, that's, again, a message for another day. So a WISC of 127 is in the high second standard deviation range. So the, the way that these tests are measured is that the mean or the average is 100. And then you have a standard deviation. Now, I know this is like, you know, AP st statistics, pull it out, right? Um, and so um, when we're looking at, um, when we're looking at a score, what we have to know is what is the, what is the mean and what is the standard deviation? So on a WISC, the mean is 100, the average is 100, and the standard deviation is 15. What that means is that 68%, 68 point something percent of people who take the WISC will fall within one standard deviation. And then almost everyone will fall within two. And then by the time you get out to three standard deviations, you're at like 98, right? 99, 99. So when we're looking at a score of 127, then you're looking at a, a, a high score. Now, to get fully two standard deviations above the mean, which would be the 95th percentile, then you're looking at a score of 130. But, you know, the test can vary. It looks at how did that kid look on that day, that particular test taker on that particular test. And so a 127 um, is almost a qualifying score for Mensa, actually, 
um, a 128 would qualify you. No. Yeah, I think so. I think that's the qualifying score. Like, this is a high score. Um, so I would not look at that and say, oh, that child's not gifted. Um, so is 127 the highest you can get? No. Do I see much higher scores? Yes. That test goes to four standard deviations. So it goes up to 160 theoretically. But um, usually what happens is you don't really get 160s. You get it like kind of like back washes, like hits a wall and washes back. So you see like in the 150s, but that's very rare. Um, a 127, a kid with a 127, if it's a full scale IQ, a kid with a 127 is going to need some advanced support in approaching a regular curriculum. So I frankly would not worry about whether my kid, I've actually written an article, is my kid gifted or just bright? I want to worry about it. What we're looking at with this is, is the child having their needs met at school? So that leads us to, I've noticed that she's been helping other kids to learn new things rather than learning new things and proceeding to next levels for her. That's a problem. So I have written about why you shouldn't use gifted students as tutors. And I've just like folded my arms because I hate this. Gifted children, um, when Del Siegler wrote the Gifted Children's Bill of Rights that NAGC publishes, he put in there that gifted children have a right to learn something every day. And that should not be like earth shattering. That should not be controversial. And yet somehow it is. But we shouldn't be using gifted kids as tutors. So if you have a gifted child who is being used as a tutor, that needs to be addressed. Even if you have no plans on moving that child out of the school, that needs to be addressed. So Connie says, amen and amen, right? So I've written a lot about why that's true. Um, but and part of it has to do with they're just not good at it. Gifted thinkers think differently than typical learners. And they don't they don't necessarily do a good job of explaining. But number one, that's not their role. They're not the teacher. Now, sometimes can you learn something more deeply by teaching someone? Yes, but it's not the best review method. So if you want to read about that, you can read about just Google gifted guru tutors. I'll put the link in the in the um, chat later. So. I wouldn't worry about it, whether a child is gifted or just bright. I would worry about what's going on in the classroom and whether the child's needs are being met. And then I would address them. What I would do is pay careful attention to them. And then I would approach the teacher and say, I'm noticing that blah, 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 blah. What are you noticing? Because you may find that what you think is going on is not actually what's going on. Not all kids are fabulous reporters of what's going on in the classroom. I'm not saying they're lying. I'm just saying that what they're noticing may not be exactly what's going on, right? The other day, so my husband is Australian, as probably many of you know. And the other day I was talking to our three-year-old granddaughter and we were talking, We were. I was reading a book to her about a wombat. And I was saying, you know, wombats are in Australia where granddad's from. And she says, yes, an Australia is really far away. You have to sleep on the plane and watch five movies. Right? And it's just interesting what kids pick up on. So she's three, but the same thing happens with 17-year-olds. So what they're bringing home from school isn't necessarily what's happening. And I used to have a thing in the letter I would send home the first day of school that said, I promise not to believe, like, if you promise not to believe everything that your child said happened in my classroom, I promise not to believe everything that your child tells me happens in your house, because I promise you that for every story a kid is taking home, that kid is bringing a story back to school. If there are teachers watching this, you know I'm right. <laughs> we hear crazy stuff. So as parents, we have to take everything with a grain of salt. So if anybody else has thoughts they want to throw in about this issue or questions about that issue, let me know. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to move on to the second and last question of the night, unless anybody else has a question. So this question was from a teacher who wanted to know, she's using the complexity, she's attended professional development that I facilitated about the depth and complexity framework. And she says she wants to know how to differentiate breakout rooms. So this particular teacher teaches at a virtual academy. So everybody is online all the time. For some of you, that sounds like heaven. For others of you, it sounds like the ninth circle of hell. She says, if we have one task 
How can we scaffold the depth and complexity for that one task across three to four breakout rooms without just creating completely separate tasks for each breakout room? So how do you differentiate different breakout rooms to do the same task? This is very easy with depth and complexity because depth and complexity is not about what they're doing, it's about what they're thinking. And the way that you would differentiate the task is just the question that you're asking. So for instance, let's say that, um, so I for real have made a set of digital depth and complexity frames. They're in Google Slides and I can have kids working in the same Google slide. I can have kids working in different Google slides. It doesn't matter. But what I could easily do is put a frame. I could put a frame on a Jamboard. I could put a frame in a Google slide, whatever. And I could send one of those frames into each breakout room. I can have that. I can do a couple of things. I don't need five different things, right? So for, for differentiation, what I recommend is no more than three. I would have scaffolded on level and then the whatever you want to call it, advanced, gifted, challenge, whatever. And what I would do then is I would create. So I'm just going to go with frame, but it wouldn't matter whatever you were doing. I would create the lesson. In this case, I'm using frame as an example for what my highest level learners could do. And I would figure out what could they do. And then I would copy and paste that. And I would adjust it a little bit. It may only take a word or two. I may need to take out one question, swap it out for a different question, copy and paste it and see what would my struggling learners need. What your struggling learners might need is you. So they may be able to answer all the same questions that you ask the unlevel learners, but they might need you. So then what I would do is, and that process, that like copy and paste process and adjustment process takes only a few minutes. I would say five minutes, maybe five minutes. Yeah. I mean, five minutes more, you're going to create your activity and then clone it and adjust it. it takes about five minutes. So then what I would do is I would ability group. So I would have one group, one breakout room. That's my advanced students. I would have two breakout rooms or however many, depending on your students, right? The bulk of the breakout rooms, your typical learners who have that that activity that you adjusted a little bit. And then I would keep the learners who need me with me. And then I would um, work with them. So unless I felt like that wasn't going to work for logistical purposes, but in general, that's what I would do. So you're not making a different activity for them. What you're doing is asking a stronger question. The other and and that stronger question doesn't have to be crazily different. So what you can do is ask them to do something in the middle. Like so for instance, let's say the the advanced learners in the middle of the epic complexity frame are going to plot out the novel and they're going to explain they're they're going to like explain two possible different climaxes of the novel whereas maybe the on level learners are it just the center is just going to have like a picture of the novel right like they don't do anything with the middle now that may seem like more differentiation like the gifted kids being asked to do more but it's really not what it is is an acknowledgement that the high level kids are going to be able to finish the rest of it first. And rather than have activities for finishers, I'm going to make that activity itself deeper. So it's what can they complete in the amount of time? So um, that is, it is at their level. What can they do at their level with that same content in that amount of time? And then, so then that would be the only difference I would do. I maybe just take out the middle, right? How long does that take? 20 seconds. So that's what I would do. Um, Depth and complexity makes that process of differentiating breakout rooms or differentiating small group instruction much, much easier than without depth and complexity. So for those of you who aren't familiar with depth and complexity, um, if you hang around me at all, you know, like I beat that drum all the time. So I wrote a book with my Colin 
colleague Ian Bird about depth and complexity. And I've written a couple other ebooks about it. I'm constantly creating stuff related to depth and complexity because depth and complexity was designed by Dr. Kaplan and Betty Gould to be a way that teachers in a gen ed classroom could raise thinking level of high ability students in the gen ed classroom. Like it was designed for differentiation. It's the only thing that and that's why I love it so much. It's so great for teachers and it saves so, so much time. Um, so that's what I would do with that. So if there are not, oh, you know what? I had one other thing. I had one other thing I mentioned and it was like the, the thumbnail for this is, what I learned from Disney. So I went to Disney World for the first time in my life. My kids had been there with orchestra and choir to perform, which is just fake, right? Like perform. Um, I mean, they did, they did perform, but it's just an excuse to go, right? So they had been to Disney World and I had not. Also, every single one of my kids has climbed Machu Picchu. And have I been to South America? That would be a negative Ghost Rider. Anyway, you know what it's like. Hashtag mom life. So I got a chance to go to, um, I got a chance to go to Disney World for the first time last December. And I was with my husband and I learned a lot from it. That I think has the implication for school. I probably took this into an article, but for now, I just want to talk about it tonight. So one of the things that Disney does is that it really, um, it really rewards people who are Disney, like, I don't know the word for it. Like the Harry Potter term is Potterhead. I don't know the Disney term for it. If any of you are Disney people. Connie says Kagan structures can be supportive guidance. Yes. Yeah. So all the Kagan, like just, are you, Connie, are you talking about something other than like the Kagan cooperative learning? There's something different called Kagan structures. I'm not familiar with that. If there is great. We'll look that I'll look that up. Um, tell me in the, in the comments, what you, what, what is that? If, if you're talking about Kagan cooperative learning stuff, yes. If you're talking about Kagan structures as something different, I don't know what that is. And I would love to learn it. So when you're booking Disney, when you're going to Disney, if you've never been there before and you don't know what you're doing, it is incredibly confusing. It was the most executive function challenge of a vacation I have ever taken in my life. There were more logistics in planning going to Disney than when I moved to Germany. Not kidding. And I thought to myself, do we do this? Do we do this to teachers? I mean, as teachers, like, do we, do we reward kids who, um, like are used to the system? If, if people are new to our country, people new to our school district, people new to our school, people new to our class, how easy is it to onboard? There was a point at which my daughter-in-law and I were talking about, do we even want to go? Like, this is so hard. Um, okay. So Lynn says, didn't you go to NAGC when it was at Disney? It's there again next year. I think, uh, no, I didn't. I don't, I don't typically attend NAGC. The last NAGC I attended was in Minneapolis when, um, Ian Bird and I got called to the principal's office, um, for insurrection. <laughs> so not even kidding. Um, but so I don't typically go, I didn't go when it was there. I have been to Orlando before for a conference, but I didn't go into Disney. So it was really, it was just really, really hard to plan. There was so much burden. And I thought to myself as teachers, we need to be very careful that we are onboarding people, that we're making not just our classroom as a whole, but every lesson approachable. We don't want to put up barriers to the lesson. We want it to be friendly. So that was kind of a negative thing I learned, but then there was a, there was a lot of positive. One of the positives that I learned was that they go to the detail. It, the magic at Disney is in the details. The magic is not in the rides, really. The magic is in the detail of the rides. There is a ride at Disney, Peter Pan, that is almost the same concept as the E.T. ride at Universal. What makes it amazing is the detail. The level of detail 
in the rides, the level of detail in the stores, the level of detail on the streets, the level of detail in the landscape, the level of detail in the, the infrastructure, the level of detail everywhere is what makes the magic. And I think that, and she says, the magic is called the plus. And I think that as teachers, there's so much that we can learn from that, that, that how do we focus on these little tiny details? And I have a son getting married. My son, Jonathan, is getting married in July. And his fiance and I were at Hobby Lobby buying like little things for the wedding. And I said to her, the things that people will notice in the decor at the reception are going to be these little things. And I think from Disney, one of the things we can learn is the magic of I, what Lynn is saying is the plus, the magic of the plus. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily take a ton of time. But as a teacher, what could you do that would make a student feel a little bit of magic? So I decided to try that myself. So I just recently created a set of depth and complexity language arts frames that are done. Like I wrote all the questions. And I thought, I'm going to be talking about the magic today. What could I do to make those have a plus, right? So I decided to go in and add rubrics. So if you bought that, go download it again, because I just added four rubrics to it. And I didn't make just regular rubrics. I made three different rubrics that looked at creativity. And I made one rubric that looked at critical thinking. And then below every rubric, I had a little quote about feedback. So the rubric itself became an experience. If you look at it, you'll you'll know what I mean. And I think that as teachers, we're never going to have, you know, 400 hours to transform our classroom. Like sometimes I look at the classroom, that guy, Ron, what, what's the name of that school? You know, that guy who wrote the like 55 essential rules, Ron Clark, that Ron Clark Academy in, a, in a, outside Atlanta, I think it's outside Atlanta. And you see that the stuff that they do in their classrooms, like what these classrooms look like, like I can't do that. I have Barbie's dream classroom. It's like a classroom that got shrunk in a dryer. I don't even have a window, right? Like I can't build two story things in there, but the magic is in the details. The magic is in the little tiny things. Can you put something on a paper? Can you use a cool color pencil? Can you, what can you do to add just that little magic touch? Um, and I think that was probably the most important thing that when you are at Disney, you feel like a part of something. You feel like you belong. You want to wear the clothes. Like now I have all these Disney shirts, right? Everybody's wearing Disney shirts. They're wearing ears. They're do they're carrying around balloons with ears, right? Like they want to be a part of it. And as teachers, if we can create a climate in our classroom that teachers feel like the students rather feel like they want to be a part of it. There's magic there. And even if you have a gifted child in your class who you can't 100% challenge at the level you'd like to every minute of the day, if they feel that magic, they will still feel like their needs are met. And I felt that because I don't ride big roller coasters. I was in a roller coaster accident. I was in a serious roller coaster accident when I was 16. And I was injured. And I don't ride big coasters. So I'm not doing Space Mountain. I'm not doing Big Thunder Mountain. I can't remember all the rides I don't do. I didn't do Matterhorn at Disneyland. Um, I don't do those. I only do the small rides. Like I'll do the, the biggest ride I'll do is Seven Boards Mine Train. <laughs> That's the biggest one I'll do. And um, and it took I and I got out of it. I walked, I waited all the way in line and then chickened out at the very last second and then tried again. Right. So I don't do those big rides, but Disney was so magical that even when I was waiting for everybody else to finish, there was something to look at. There was something to engage me. There was something just around the corner. I just kept feeling like every time I turned a corner, there was going to be something else. And so I feel like that's something as teachers, we can learn from Disney. Even if our kids have to wait, like, you know, they're waiting out a ride. What is their magical that they could engage in? And I think to some extent that comes when we bring that, when we bring ourselves. So I think about how I have like the things I love, you know, I love, I love books. And so I have like, I just got this new thing today um, that I love, which is a print of all the homes in Little Women. And I love Little Women so much. And I like, 
I used my allowance to buy this beautiful print. And so I'm going to surround myself with that. But when kids come into my class and they see images of the Hobbit hole and they see images of, of Hogwarts and they see images of Pemberley and they see images of these places that I love, then that it becomes part of the magic. And so I just encourage you to create a little magic in your classroom and it doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to be time consuming. It just has to be you. You bring the magic. Because that's what it is. It's like Walt Disney brought this magic because of his imagination. And that's where it's going to come from is your imagination. So um, Lynn says, I'm 100% Disney person. I know the planning and talking about the system. Friends, it is no joke. I have a couple of master's degrees and I found it challenging. So it is no joke. But it became worth it. But I would say I don't recommend that. Have a low bar. Have the magic, but without the crazy. Um, and so Catherine Bryant says, unfortunately, the magic I've created in gifted pullout and enrichment experience is seen as elitist. Yeah, that's a thing. That's a thing. I just got mad reading that, right? Like, that's a thing. Our biggest pushback is from other teachers, other teachers who don't want good things for children. What is up with that? What is up with that? Yeah, it's seen as elitist. But you know what, Catherine? Here's what I would say. It wouldn't even matter if it was gifted pullout. When you create magic in your classroom, even if you're a gen ed teacher, like I was, like I, when in my gen ed classes, not my AP classes, in my gen ed classes, I create magic. And at least I try and I get pushback from other teachers. The people who give me the hardest time are other teachers who are threatened by it. So it wouldn't even matter if it was gifted pull out. People just use um, that as an excuse because we have an anti gifted bias in our culture that that somehow if you meet the needs of kids who are smarter than the average bear, somehow it's unfair to the other animals in the forest, um, then that's a problem. So I think that I'm, I'm sorry that that's happening to you, Catherine, but I will say that you are not alone and it wouldn't even, it wouldn't even just be a case if it, if you were not in a gifted pullout, it, gifted pullout just gives them an excuse to judge you. But I promise you, that any teacher watching this right now and any of the ones who are going to watch this replay, so hundreds of teachers will see this replay, and I guarantee you that there will be teachers in the replay who are like, yeah, every time I do something cool, the place I get it from are my fellow teachers. And, I, and Connie's saying, sing it loud. And I think this is a thing, and this is a problem. Teachers have a very much, not, not all teachers, not all teachers, but within our profession, we have to own that there is a knocking to poppies mentality that we get threatened by other teachers who are doing stuff that's cool. And instead of saying, huh, they're doing something cool. Is that something I want to do? Would that be a good fit for my class? No. Okay. They do stuff that's cool. But that kind of petty jealousy and envy it's like we act like we're still in high school instead of teaching high school, right? Like, or we act like we are in third grade instead of teaching third grade. So I'm sorry that that's happening to you, Catherine. Right? Look, Lynn is saying you're not alone. You're not alone. And I think that what we need to do is normalize magic, normalize the magic. And I'm glad you're doing it because you're, and we're back to teacher ego. Oh my gosh, we talked about that in the beginning. Exactly. Lynn. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, Hey, did you get your book? So Lynn came to my um, teacher likes books, came to my live stream. I did last week where I talked about the, uh, like the value of beautiful editions of books and the role they have in our lives. And she won a copy of the secret garden and it was supposed to have been shipped to her and arrive on Tuesday. So I'm curious if you got it. Um, so I don't always do giveaways, but when I do, it's super fun. She did. Oh, she loves it. So beautiful. Yay. I sent you like the super cool edition. So I'm really excited about it because I I was planning on doing the one, but then they had that one. And I was like, yeah, I love that one. So, um, so we're right back to... Um, this teacher ego, and I think we need to get beyond it as a profession. And if we're going to serve children, all children, not just gifted children, we've got to get beyond the super ego. We've got to set ourselves aside and not worry about what other teachers are doing in their classrooms, but just bring our own magic to our classroom. And, and 
William Wordsworth said this, this is my teaching motto. What we have loved, others will love, and we will show them how. And that's what teaching is. It is a, it is an invitation to love what we've loved. And if we focus on what we love, then we will be less focused. Like if we focus on what we love and why we're teaching, because we love children and we love this thing that we're teaching, if we focus on that and how we can convey that love to our students whom we also love, then we won't have time or mental energy to worry about what other teachers are doing and judge them. So Connie says, invitational heart will quietly win some who are ready to join us. And that is true. Have an invitational heart. I love that. That's a beautiful phrase. Teacher Lake's book says, I haven't read it, meaning The Secret Garden, in forever. So I'm going to wait for a rainy day and enjoy. You know, I would recommend, while we're talking about Secret Garden briefly, that the musical of The Secret Garden is fabulous. So if you can get a video of it or listen to the music, it's really, really good. Winters on the Wing is one of my very favorite songs from a musical of all time. So I love it. You guys, thank you so much. I love coming into these office hours and and the community and a place where teachers can come and ask questions and parents can ask questions. And I think a lot of times we as teachers can get good discussions from these parent questions. Oh, Catherine knows the music of The Secret Garden. It's not that popular of a musical, but it's really good. Um. I love that we have this community together and I appreciate your taking the time to participate in it. Remember, if you have any questions, you can just email them to me at lisa at giftedguru.com or um, just put them in the chat. Um, I will see them. And Connie, thank you for that. Thank you for that comment. She put tonight was so uplifting. I'm so glad. Um, you can ask questions in the stream or ahead of time. Either way is fine. And I typically do them once a month. This month, I did an extra one because I had the books and this is an uh, uh, technically an office hours. So thank you guys so much. And I hope that you have a lot of fun um, creating your own magic in your classroom. Take care. Thank you guys for your kind words. I truly do appreciate it.